Grace and peace to you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to online worship with the American International Church. We gather today to learn what it is to be a pilgrim community. We gather bringing our hopes and our fears, our memories and our visions. We gather longing for the guidance of God's Spirit to give us renewal and courage for the days ahead. Come, Christ Jesus, be in our midst wherever we are. Bless us as we remember those who have shown us your way forward. Help us to find a clear vision for the future as we learn to be your disciples day by day. As we begin to worship together, wherever you are, whatever day it is today, I invite you to join me in our prayer of invocation with the words on the screen. Draw your church together, O Lord, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him and his mission to the world, and together witnessing to his love on every continent and island. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. And now, my friends, whatever day it is, wherever you are, as you join in the worship recorded here in our sanctuary, I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to those you know and love who need that word of encouragement and friendship and prayer today. Someone in the room with you with a hug and a kind word or someone far away with an email, a text message, whatever it takes to communicate with that person. And to you, may the peace of Christ be always with you.
scripture today comes from Ezra 1, 1 and 8. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem, in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem, in Judah, and build the temple of the Lord the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with <coughs> silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose heart God has moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mid Reda the treasurer, who counted them out to Shesh Bazar, the prince of Judah. This is the word of the Lord. First of all, before I begin, a little word of appreciation. You might have noticed that Sedanam, our scripture reader, and I are wearing the same dress. And so is Rivers, who gave us each these as a gift from her trip to Sierra Leone. And so we all get to wear them to match and shine. I love this radiant yellow and purple. Um, so thank you to Rivers. However, you might also have noticed that I happen to be wearing it with her trainers which, if you know me, is not normally my attire on a Sunday morning. I sprained my ankle really terribly earlier in the week, and thankfully they said it's fine to walk on it and all the rest, but to keep wearing my trainers. So forgive me if I move a little slow and a little funny, and I have my trainers on with this lovely dress. <laughs> Will you join with me in a word of prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all my hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're starting in today on a bit of a study over the next six weeks for two books of the Bible that don't get a lot of attention, Ezra and Nehemiah. I'll admit, in 20 years of preaching, I was doing the math, probably I'm closing in on 800 sermons now, not one, not one of those sermons has ever been from the book of Ezra or Nehemiah until today. So why now? What is it about this time and these books that seem to go together? I want to hear the words of Old Testament scholar John Golden Gay, who writes that in Scripture, God speaks to people where they are. Our privilege, then, is to overhear that speaking, 
in order that we may hear God speaking to us where we are. And I want to turn to the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah in the coming weeks with you because I think that where they are in that story bears a resemblance to where we are in ours. And I'd like to overhear what God was saying to them. Maybe we might hear what God has to say for us. So here's the story. It's about 600 years before Christ. And King Nebuchadnezzar has ruled the empire of Babylon and conquered the city of Jerusalem. The people of Israel have been conquered by empires before, but this time is different and way worse. Nebuchadnezzar didn't just colonize and demand that they send money and obedience back to Babylon. He dismantled and destroyed every city and kingdom that came his way. The Babylonians destroyed the Temple of Solomon. They took out all the sacred objects, the silver and the gold. They carried them off to Babylon to add and hang them up on the walls of the temples of their own gods. Nebuchadnezzar deposed the king and forced him into exile, but not just the king. All the people of the royal house, anybody who worked in the temple, all the government officials, all the bankers, all the merchants, all the landowners, anybody who had a piece of power or authority was deported to Babylon. Left behind in Jerusalem, the poor, the powerless, the peasants, and a bunch of empty buildings. But all empires come to an end eventually. Fast forward 60 years, and along come the Persians. And they conquer those terrible Babylonians. King Cyrus of Persia takes an entirely different approach to Nebuchadnezzar. Instead of destroying everything in his path, Cyrus decides to rebuild it. Go back, he says to all those people who've been in Babylon for the last 60 years. Here, we'll even round up the treasures that Nebuchadnezzar took, and we'll send you home with money to rebuild everything in the cities you left behind. And you will be loyal to me, because I've done this for you. And when you build those houses to all of your gods across my empire, you pray for me in those houses of worship, because I am the one who restored you. Now, that's the part of the story we heard today that, that Sedanon read for us, where, and that is where Ezra and Nehemiah begin. The news breaks down from King Cyrus. Everybody's going back. Pick it up where you left off. Resume your business and your activities. Get on with all the things you've missed. And then the books of Ezra and Nehemiah go on to tell us what happens when they do. The experience of returning after a long exile. What's it like to go back when they haven't seen their home or their office or their school or their place of worship for such a long time? See now why I think this might be a good text for us to study right now. I'd like to hear and overhear what God was saying to them when they went back. So we might know what God's saying to us as we go back. Spoiler alert, it's messy and wonderful and painful and conflicted and a whole lot of work and so holy and so good. I feel that looking out at this great crowd today. Like us, 
They imagined a grand return and triumph and in celebration, only to realize that they had to build everything back one piece at a time. Like us, they sat in exile and dreamed of the day that they could go back to normal, only to realize normal didn't exist anymore. Like us, they discovered the joy of reunion and return, somehow also awakened to the grief of everything that had been lost over their time apart. Like us, especially a word for our YouTube folks watching at home, like us, not everyone was ready to return. And some people continued on quite faithfully living and working in Babylon in the pattern and the ways they established there. Like us, it wasn't just the people and the patterns of behavior that had changed, it was the people themselves. The exile had left them scarred and strengthened, and they returned different people than when they had left. Like us, they yearned to be whole, connected with one another and with God in communion and in community. We'll hear more about all of this as we work our way through these stories from Ezra and Nehemiah in the weeks to come. But I pray we'll overhear God and be able to listen better for God now. And it starts right here in this very first little bit of story that we get. On first reading, this opening passage sounds like it's all about King Cyrus, doesn't it? <laughs> it's all about his plan and what he's going to do and his empire and how they're all getting back and organizing the people and the stuff to ship it back to Jerusalem. But a closer look you realize that God is everywhere in this story. In the opening verses, we remember that God sent prophets like Jeremiah to speak to the people in exile and to teach them that God doesn't only live in the temple in Jerusalem, but wherever they find themselves. And then the Bible reminds us that King Cyrus did not get his ideas from nowhere. It was God stirring his heart. It was God who moved Cyrus to let the people return. King Cyrus himself evokes the God of heaven and says, God be with you to those who are departing. This is the next lesson that we have come to know in our time of exile. For them and for us, the starting place when it's time to return, we know more than ever before that God doesn't only dwell here in this house. God doesn't only appear when we gather here and sing and pray together, though we rejoice that we can do that again. God has been with us and will be with us wherever we go, moving in our hearts and in our lives, and sustaining us in promises of hope and restoration. Returning today, we remind ourselves of this reality in the rituals that we share. First, we come here to this communion table. Ahead of his own departure and his own death, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Wherever you go, whenever you gather, wherever you drink and eat together, I am there also. We come to this table to be reminded that as God joins us in this bread and this cup, we can
carry God with us to every table where we sit in the world. Alone and with one another, communion, in communion with Christ and all God's people. And second, the act of blessing. Just as we take this ordinary bread and bless it and break it at the table, Jared led the children to go and bless their new prey ground at the back of the sanctuary, to bless that space. In a little while, we're going to offer blessings to all of the young people as they get ready and maybe have already returned to school. And after worship, Jared and I will be available to bless any of you for whatever it is that you're returning to. But the thing about a blessing is that it doesn't infuse holiness into something that was otherwise profane. The blessing reminds us that all people, all places, all objects can carry God with us and for us. That's the lesson of the exile. That God's blessing and God's sacred power are portable. Not just here, but everywhere we go. This opening chapter of the book of Ezra, like so much of the work of return, first comes off as purely secular and ordinary and unholy. The more we look, the more we realize that God is infused in every step. Every decision to reopen and regather, to stay, to wait, every sacred object packed up to ship back, put out, every person who steps forward to make the journey, every person who stays behind, God is in everyone. The blessing is carried in everyone at every table. May our souls overhear that wisdom as we reunite and renew and return this season. Amen.
God of everywhere and everything. We've learned, like the people of Ezra's time, that your presence abides whether we are near or whether we are far, both gathered and scattered, shattered and restored. You fulfill your promises of hope and renewal. You do not abandon us. We thank you that we can again sing our praises, that our children can come together to learn about your love, that we can see old friends and meet new ones. As we return to familiar places and turn into new beginnings, keep us ever mindful that we live and love only by your everlasting love and enduring mercy. Forgive us when we cut ourselves off from you and from one another. The story of exile and return brings to mind the countless refugees in our world today. Offer safe haven to the people of Afghanistan, those who fled in recent weeks and those still seeking a way out. Shelter those displaced by climate change, floods, fires, earthquakes, and storms. Grant safety to those victims of violence and oppression seeking asylum, and sustenance to those facing desperate economic straits. Heal those cut off from family and friends by COVID or quarantine, and all the conflict about them. Reconnect us with one another. Help us recognize your blessing in every bit of our lives. For all our returns, to work, school, social life, may worship and prayer guide all we do, that we would lead lives of devotion and service. We pray as your Son and our Savior taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome once more to Worship with the American International Church. It is so good to see your faces and to have you here with us, and so good to have those of you worshiping online with us continuing to join us in the best way you can from wherever you are and whatever day it is as you are watching. If you're a guest with us today, or if this is your first time worshiping with us, we are so grateful that you're here, so glad to see you and meet you. We would love to get some details from you so that we can include you in our communications and keep you up to date on the ministries of the church. There are some cards in the back uh, that, that we would ask you to fill out for us, or if you're really high tech, there's a QR code in our bulletin that you can scan and fill out a Google form for us. Just a couple of things to note for you. Next Sunday, the 12th, is our family picnic. Uh, if you are a family with children, we can hope that you will join us for that. Our crash is reopening with the lovely Monica, who hopefully you know or will meet, returning uh, in two weeks on the 19th. And as you've seen, our choir is back. If you are interested in joining our choir, talk to Scott, email music at amchurch.co.uk and join us. And also, there's more things going on, and you now have a printed bulletin for the first time in a long time, so please pay attention to that, and uh, there is more information there for you. We do ask that you continue to respond to God by giving to the ministries of the church with your time, your presence, and your gifts. There's a plate at the back for you to give on your way out, or of course, details for giving by bank transfer are in the bulletin and on the website. Would you stand with us once again as we continue to, to worship through this?
that? Amen. Wherever we go, everything, everywhere, every object, every person, every place is already infused with the love of God. So go out and seek it, know it, and worship God every day. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.